Good morning. Somebody asked me today if the same scripture reading. Yes. Yes. It is. Because it's such a common story. I know bedtime stories are always from Exodus, like they're supposed to be. But if some of y'all read the New Testament. It's okay, y'all are still people. Um, but what we're talking about still is we're still in this concept of a veiled life, a veiled heart, a veiled body. And so we have been talking about this temple that was torn. This temple that tore when Christ was on the cross. One of the things that happened was the temple veil. The veil that separated the holy of holies. That place that is so sacred that we just repeat the word holy till you get the point. The holy of holies. From that which is just the sacred place. And this veil is torn from top to bottom. And last week we talked about it being... 60 to 90 foot tall. This week I want you to consider another concept of this veil. It's 60 foot tall. It's a hand breadth thick. It's 90 to 100 foot wide. So as you can guess, this thing is a little bit heavy. Just a little bit. So we're talking somewhere between 2 and 4 tons. To try to lift a veil that is as thick as my hand... 100 something foot wide, 60 and 90 feet high. And, and this veil separates God's very presence, the one that we needed protection from just a little bit of God's glory on Moses' face. That protection that God says it's good that you're afraid to look at Moses' face. Because that glory is so overwhelming, it's so deep, it's so heavy. And, and the weight of God's glory is so great. And so today I have an Old Testament. That's all this book is. There's none of that sneaky new stuff in it. It's all the good old-fashioned stuff, right? The good old days, right? None of y'all are 3,000 years old, but it's okay. So I, I, just, I, you know, I got to think about this, and this is a one-ton jack, right? And this veil was somewhere between two and four tons. And so I was, I was wondering you know, what it would take, feel like to try to lift that. I mean, because they don't have bottle jacks, they don't have pump jacks, they don't have jacks. And so it's pretty simple. I mean, this is a one-ton jack. Obviously, it can lift this little Old Testament. And so all you got to do is pump it. So um, how it works is you, you stick this in, um, and then you pump it, and it, it fills, um, it lifts your car. Uh, <laughs> no, there's something that I missed here. And I want you to know this is just a modified bottle jack. That's all this jack is. And there's something that I miss, and there's a reason that I can sit here and I can't even pick up the Old Testament. I can't lift it. And it's one of those things that we often forget, and what we're forgetting is this. Without God, without that Holy Spirit's movement, without God coming, then the Old Testament, that law is too heavy. It is completely too heavy. And, and the one thing I'm missing here, I don't know if you know, is air. I forgot to close the air leak. Well, not really forget. It's kind of sneaky. And once we've got that Holy Spirit, which is invisible, and you can't even tell the difference, and all of a sudden that wall that's so heavy that it cannot be lifted is easily lifted. I only use two fingers. And what God uh, did for us was to make the law so light, so easy to lift because His Spirit lifted it. Because Christ lifted it, and it's no longer us lifting it, but it is God lifting it, and we just feel like we're doing something. We feel like we're doing something great, but in reality, God is doing all the real work. I'm not pumping that up. Air is. Today we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, 
Not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light. The light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I, I wanted to reuse that same imagery from the Old Testament. Is that face. How they couldn't look at Moses' face because it's shining and they're afraid that they look on the glory of God. That Shekinah, that perfect glory, and they will die. And those who went beyond this veil, who walked into the Holy of Holies, needed only one answer, death. Because the glory of the Lord was there. The same veil that Jesus tears down. And, and today we want to talk about that life. That life that is unveiled in Christ and it's no longer where we get so confused what's really going on. Because <coughs> you hear him talking about it, he said, you know, we're, we're not the ones who are turning back to adultery and sin and we're just living in this darkness again. Because we understand what's really going on. I'm moving a little tiny bar. I don't care if there's a car sitting on top of this. It makes no difference. Because the only thing lifting a car is <coughs> air. Little tiny bits of air. Invisible to us. And too often we get to thinking, oh, I'm doing that bar and that's the real work. And somebody's crazy enough to go out to a car and say, well, I've got a bar, all right, let's get the jack. I'm going to pick up a car because I'm smart. Right? And how many of us are dumb enough to go out there and say, okay, I've got the back of this car. Some of you might be big enough to do this. And you just start there and you lift it up. And then you get hurt really bad. We go to the hospital later. None of us are really dumb enough to think that if I go to a car and I lift it up and just pull it up, I'm just going to lift up half the car. But yet when we do things, when we serve God and we think that we're really doing something, we forget that God is using our effort. God is using what we're doing and it's no longer about, well, did we get all the wrongs right? Did we cover the law perfectly? But it's more a question of, do I love God? And in loving God, am I following Him? And then when I'm loving God and following Him and doing Him and seeking His will, that face, that when it was on Moses' face, we had to hide from it. But that face, when it was the Son of God, and it is the same glory, we can look at Christ and be welcomed in. Because we're not dumb enough to think we're actually doing it. We know that the Spirit is doing it through that which we offer Him. Starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels, our bodies. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death. For Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you all. Verse 13, but having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I speak, for we also believe. Therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all these things are for your sakes. 
so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. How many of us have really gotten stuck on this, our being our body? We're so used to it. I say, well, you know, what are you like? And you might describe a mirror. <laughs> Think about it. You get up and you're like, this is me. I, I look in a mirror and I see me. No, you don't. I don't know how many people are forgotten to be told, when you look in a mirror, you don't see yourself. You see an earthen vessel that dwells the greatest glory of all time. Amen. And it just kind of happens to look like that goofy sucker in the mirror. And he talks about that constant dying and being made alive because we are immortal. And we are so stuck on this body, but we have to think about it. Being an immortal being and being clothed in this earthly vessel. Not, none of us walk in here and go, this is my clothes. For the simple fact that one, it'd be really tiny at this point. Imagine if you got your clothes as an infant, that was your clothes. And today, you tried to come in here in a onesie. <laughs> Fair? And what we'll do with our bodies? We, we don't understand. We are immortal beings who live forever, and we go, this... You know, because we've had this body since birth, we assume that's the body. And we get so stuck on that, and we forget that we need to be living gloriously because we are not the vessel that contains it. I don't go buy a Coke because the container's nice. I want it because there's liquid in there that'll kill me. <laughs> I don't want a bottle of water so I can have a nice bottle. And I don't want to be a being who's so obsessed with this life. This temporary life. That I forget that I'm, I'm trying to live out of glory right now. A glory that reminds, let's go back to our story, and I love this story, is this veil that protects me from God. It's not as though God needed this veil, it's as though I needed that veil. I love that veil. We always think, well, God tore it down, it was needless. No, it was protecting me. It was my blanket. It was the only thing that kept me safe at night. Because when I came close to the glory of God, I knew that veil was there to keep me safe. God being on the other side, so great, so powerful, so overwhelming. And the veil's there to protect me. That veil's there to keep me safe. And yet he throws all that away and says, here's the glory of God. Look on the face of Jesus. And he goes one further. And we're good with, when anytime we talk about God's glory being on Jesus, we're okay with that. I mean, he's part of the Trinity. It works for us. It's when he's not talking about God. When he starts talking about us. Knowing he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. We forget that the temple is what we're describing. That Holy of Holies is one piece of the temple. And the reason that Holy of Holies is important is because that is the part of the temple where God is. And most of us have been told that we are the temple of God. But yet we, we forget that the temple was this big complex with many things. And there's only one room that really fits the description for us. This word that we could sit here and say, if we want to translate it correctly, we'd say holy, 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 holy. And we'd stop when we get, you know, we pass out of something. If we really wanted to use the correct name and translate it right, we would just say holy until we passed out. That is the temple that we are. That's the temple that we should be living. We should be in this dark world and so bright that everybody's going, come on, turn it down a little bit. It shouldn't be one of those where we go, 
well, that's a Christian. That's not. Uh, the way you tell the difference is this one wears the bracelet. They, they got that. See that what would Jesus do bracelet? And the necklace? That's how you tell the difference. That's not what he's describing you. He says, this darkness for God who said, let light shall shine out of darkness. What are we? Darkness. What are we doing? Shining. Wait a minute. That doesn't work. If I want light, I don't go into the darkness and say, you know, change. I go drag a candle in there. I flip those little magic switches. And yet God doesn't do that. He takes darkness. He takes us. The filth that is us, that which rebelled against him, caused him to crucify his son. He takes that darkness. And he doesn't no longer say, there'll be a light in them. He doesn't. He doesn't say that concept that we twisted so bad that they've got a light. No, they don't have a light. They are a light. And it's not that we possess the glory of God, we possess the light of God, we represent Him. We are ambassadors. A term which makes us uncomfortable because it's so close to blasphemy that He is taking us as darkness and saying, now you are light bulbs. Not, not something you carry as a light bulb, not something you do as a light bulb, not those works, but you yourself. And we ask ourselves, what kind is it? Because He started with this, He said, not that we're sinful, if you spray paint a light bulb black, it does nothing. It gets really hot. That's it. Doesn't mean it's not light bulb. Doesn't mean that that full light is not there. It just means you've covered it up with darkness. And it can't shine through. And when he's talking about darkness, he's talking about not being able to see anything. And all of a sudden there's this light and it's Kind of like hunting deer, it's illegal to spotlight. You shine that a light that bright in a deer's eyes and it can't move. And that's the world should be seen. They should be like that deer, they should say, Ah, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Christ said, He said, They will know us. No, 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 well, you mean they'll think we're Christians, right? No, sorry, wrong quote. It was, They will know we are Christians. What? God says things a certain way because he means it. He will, they will know we are Christians by our love. And it's like that deer. It's not like you can go, oh, I think there's a light over there. No, it's one of those, you got this two million candle lights shining around your face, and you go, that's a light. And when people look at us, they don't need to go, well, they're kind of like everything else. They need to go, they're shining so bright, I can't overwhelm it. And the darkness cannot overcome the light. John 1. He continues in verse 16. Gives us this encouragement at the end to live a life that is filled with the weight of that kind of glory. <clears throat> Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight. For momentary, lie affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. <coughs> that four tons got nothing on us. That four-ton veil that separates from God has nothing on us. I don't know the way it said. The weight of <coughs> glory. Far beyond all comparison. So when I'm talking about picking a car, it's not that funny anymore. Because in reality, that's just a glimpse of the kind of glory that we're shining forth with. The weight of the glory that we present is not our own. It is a living and dying through Christ. It is a death, burial, resurrection.
and a story. This is a story. A story of God's love working to get us. Working to rescue us. So that we could be His ambassadors. We could be His light in darkness. We could be darkness become light. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God, <coughs> we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Tonight we're offered something beautiful. This day we're given this opportunity that this night around us this darkness that is the world this night in which we really look at the world and see the darkness that it is and we know that God wants to take us from being darkness to being light and he says in this night I want you to be daylight and he offers us a righteousness that required him to make no sin, sin. That required him to make darkness light. And that is what he offers us. He offers us that sacrifice. If there's anyone today believing that Jesus is Lord. Confessing Jesus as Lord. Repenting of your sins. Being buried with Christ. Resurrected to live his life, so that we can go and live as light in this night. If there's anybody who needs to respond to that, that invitation stays open. Talk to me, talk to an elder. Grab somebody by the hand, they'll lead you in the right place. If there's anybody who needs prayers, or if there's anyone who wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand, as we sing.